Okay, guys. Um, thank you for joining us. So let me go here. Um, folks, I'm delighted to have Dr. Jianju Hu uh, to uh, give this um, you know, seminar. One of the reasons I wanted him to give the seminar is because he runs a very active research program and um, is good for our CS students to know what's happening here. Perhaps they are looking for guidance uh, for their further research. So he's a full professor in the computer science department. And um, uh, you guys have probably seen his Vita. I won't say much about it, but uh, uh, he runs a lab uh, you know, called machine learning uh, and evaluation, evolution laboratory. There's a link to that in the, um, you know, in, in the announcement. And his current research interests include AI for science, machine learning, deep learning, evolutionary algorithms, and their applications in material informatics, bioinformatics, health informatics, and automated design synthesis. Um, and he has over 200 papers. So thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Um, so, First, I welcome everybody to um, join this seminar. Um, I see some familiar faces from my class of uh, pattern recognition, and there are many new faces. So um, I hope today's talk can give you a new kind of understanding of what is possible with the new generation of uh, generative AI. So. Um, before we get started, I want to show, amaze you guys, to show the power of generative AI by OpenAI's solar AI software that can generate a one minute video from only text prompt. So suppose you have a story script, you want to generate a video for it. So you just give this description of what you want, and then, the generative AI is going to do the magic. This is totally generated automatically without the human interference by the AI program. Isn't it crazy? So let me just leave a little guys. So all this is completely generated by the text to video generator. Okay, so you can imagine this kind of complex objects with so many constraints, they can be automatically generated from the text prompt without violating obvious, uh, you know, uh, physics. Isn't this amazing? So, um, so our our work, you know, is a, uh, it's not goes beyond this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, entertainment gen content generation. So generative AI now is a, a buzzword, you know, in every industry, and basically showing um, what kind of applications um, that you can apply to generative AI, you know. Um, in addition to this uh, uh, videos, you can have music composition, you can have art and the design, you, have, you can have the text generation, uh, product design, and some diagnosis. Okay, and um, today, based on our work, we're going to, you know, do some more serious business. So, of course, generating short videos and putting it on TikTok is very appealing, right? Um, but that's, that doesn't mean to solve our societal problem, okay? Our, to solve the fundamental problem of a society, we need to go to physics, we need to go to chemistry, we need to go to manufacturing. So uh, if you look at the uh, crisis that we are facing, the, like climate change, essentially, you know, we, we need a uh, efficient power system. We need, you know, carbon, um, carbon free, you know, uh, uh, energy. We want, you know, a high capacity battery, right? For our electric vehicle. So all those is related to how do you invent uh, ideal material, right? for those systems. So the first problem is really how do you invent the material, you know, and um, the third one, you know, when you're trying to think about how do you design the drugs, 
uh, that can you know um, deal with the diabetes, cancer. Um, those problems actually essentially is reduced to how do you find the uh, molecule or drugs with a specific structure and the function so that, so that they can block the biological pathway um, that leads to, for example, obesity. So um, the fundamental of cancer um, and uh, disease problem, it's also reduced to the, the design of our structures. The design of structures molecules. On top, you have the structures materials. So solving this challenging, they are all reduced to the design problem of structures. So traditionally, how this kind of design, you know, drugs and uh, materials is uh, conducted in the in the field. Uh, if you go to the any of the mechanical engineering or chemistry department, you ask any faculty, okay, how do you invent, right? How do you how do you uh, design? And they can tell you, okay, you start with some, you need to read, you know, this this mini paper, get you know five years training, get some basic knowledge, and then you accumulate some heuristic knowledge. Right, and then you look at a candidate and try to come up with you know, ad, um, you know, ad hoc or uh, some cool idea. And you figure out the you know constraints. You figure out the topology and the function relationship. Just like you you, you take the electric engineering course, you have to figure out how a circuit can lead to a specific function. So you you take years of training to learn all those sort of heuristic knowledge, and then you do a structure design, you do a parameter design. And then you change the material to get results. So obviously, you know, traditional um, design process is a very heuristic, a tedious trial and error process. Okay, so so there are many um, limitations because if you go to the material science, they're going to say, okay, it's not easy to find a good idea. Okay, because usually, you know, they the finding the ideal material is like finding the needle in the haystack. You have so many possible solutions, and you can only test one or a very few of them. You know, if you think that a single candidate material it takes maybe several months. So how many samples you can test? Right, very limited. So you can only have a huge design space, but you can only test a few. Um, so and usually because of your limitation of your understanding of the problem. Usually, your idea is suboptimal in the design space. Okay. And when you design any problem, there are so many constraints to the design solution. Okay. For example, if you find the material, the material must be synthesizable, must, must be stable, must be resistant to, to heat, to pressure. You know, there are many conflicting constraints. And to include this constraint, your design search process is very, very challenging. Okay. So, and there are so many rules that you need to specify, and some of them you cannot even specify explicitly. So we just, you know, our pro success depends on luck, right? That's whenever you find a, a good material published in Nature Science paper. So uh, what we are trying to, you know, in the generative AI age, we're trying to propose that design can be you know, regarded as a Lego assembly game, just as we do in our childhood, right? So if you look at it, you know, in computer vision, you have the images, so the images essentially can put the pixel, pixel, multiple pixel can put the pixel patch and the straps. So the image is just a assembly of pixel and the patch with a hierarchical assembly relationship. Same with the language. So in the language, you have the character, can burst your words, words your sentence, sentence with your paragraph, and that's the text. And in part G, we have the same building, kind of building block. You have amino acid, amino acid sequence, um, and you have sequence is going to fold in your second dimensional structure and fold in your three dimensional structure. So you can see the common, you know, all our words, you know, whatever stuff you're working on is basically how do you play the Lego game of a couple of building blocks. Of a different path, right? Same thing for the molecule. Molecule, you have the ions, you have bonds, you have the um, group, chemical groups, you form the organic molecule. You have material, you have the atom bonds, the polyhedron, you have this structure. So uh, we are solving all this problem together with our you know, generative AI, which is the technique is actually very similar to the 
um, to the um, um, the video generator that I showed you before. So the success of the uh, of this idea have already led one breakthrough in the uh, in uh, in biology, essentially for Google Google DeepMind. The Google DeepMind they they have uh, used this uh, you know um, deep learning model to develop the AlphaFolder program, which can predict the structure, which can predict structure of the sorry, which can predict the structure of the proteins. Okay, so um, but here I want to show, I want to show how do we can apply this for material. Okay, so that's our goal of today's talk. Um, if you think about the deep learning in the AI age, essentially deep learning is good at uh, patterns. Okay, so it's good at the pattern recognition, which is for deep learning for computer vision. It's good at the uh, pattern prediction, and it's good at the pattern editing, and it's good at the pattern generation. So, so now our work is uh, mainly about here pattern generations, right? How do you generate the molecule? And material and uh, all kinds of structures. So, uh, so where our design of drugs and the materials and the protein and the molecules, they are all is the design of the building blocks. Okay. So, um, of course, based on the structure of the building block, our representation of the building blocks and how do you assemble them are different. Okay. But the fundamental principle, how do you assemble this uh, building block so that they satisfy the constraints and um, achieve a specific function? In that aspect, they are the same. Okay, so essentially, you know, after you, you know, <laughs> um, uh, listen, um, taking this lect, uh, this seminar, you should be able to, you know, goes back to your own, you know, building block uh, assembly problem and the design. Problems. Okay, so uh, in our work, um, we always start with easy problem, right? So, um, so first, um, in our total talk, we have three kind of uh, uh, generative design problem. The first one is uh, uh, how do you generate a material formula? That means the the chemical formula. So if you have taken you know any chemistry course, course. Um, you know, material can be represented by the formulas. So this kind of formula, they are not uh, random, you know. So you cannot say, I randomly pick some, you know, uh, element symbol and put them together, and you expect they can, they can be synthesized into a material. That's not true, okay? Most of them, they are not. So there are some, you know, implicit rule that uh, um, allow some kind of uh, elements can be mixed together to form a stable structure. Okay, so um, the second one is that uh, first one you we use the composition design using the generative adversarial network is one kind of generative AI model, and then we also do composition design using the transformer model, which is the same model used by Open AI's so Chat uh, GPT. So you see, because the Chat GPT is used by Open AI for text generation, we use it for chemical material design. And you can see, you know, the similarity. So, and finally, we talk about the generated design for material structures using the uh, GAM model. Okay. So, uh, before we look in the um, in technical details, I want to show the complexity of your pro of our problem. Same thing. If you want to apply this technique to your problem, you need to think of what's special about your design problem. So, in our case, is. Uh, you know, crystal material is different from any other random structures. Crystal material, they, one of the major differences is that they have, you know, some severe uh, challenges for design a, a stable material. For example, um, it has, uh, you know, more than, you know, 85 element types, right? Total, you know, more than 85 commonly used element types, um, which is much more than the uh, amino acid sequence. So this problem is more difficult than the protein folding problem that the Google has solved. Because we have much more, you know, diverse of element type. And uh, also crystal structure are highly symmetric. If you look at the, 
look at the structure here, right? You can see the beauty of the symmetry. So, yeah, so crystals, they always form this kind of symmetry, symmetry constraints. So if you have an item here, then they can define all of all these other symmetric itemizations. So they have very strong, highly constrained structure. Uh, usually, if you have familiar, familiar with the constrained optimization, the constraints always make your search, make your optimization to be challenged, more challenging. Okay, so, um, uh, and also, you know, the uh, material composition is that elements that have different oxidation states. So when you have a chemical formula, the um, oxidation states uh, summed together must be neutral, okay? So there are some chemical constraints like the neutrality of the oxidation states, check neutral. And they also have the electronegativity balance and they also need to be form stable structure um, that can you know, uh, hold it, the structure without collapse, and they should be also be synthesizable. So yeah, there are a long list of constraints that make this random you know, uh, generation of structure not, not work. So how do we, how do we you know, um, train a deep learning model to do the um, formula, you know, the more, um, material formula design? So, um, so here I, we, we show a list of formulas, right? Each of them, you know, can post some uh, elements with a different proportion, you know, they, um, and then, right? How do we, how do we make this into a computer science uh, generation pattern, right? So if you, if you have, or have not, if you have not taken my course, you should take my course next semester, machine learning course, 883, right? Then you, <laughs> So essentially, we are faced with a new uh, material science problem, and we need to convert it into our computer science AI problem. Right. So, um, so in our AI, everything is represented by numbers, correct? So neural network only deal with numbers. So to 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 allow us to generate the chemical formula, we need to convert our formula into a numerical representation, correct? Yeah. So to represent this formula into into a, a numerical representation, we convert it into a matrix, a one part matrix. And um, so, so currently we have in one of our database, we have 120,000 known materials as our training sample. For each of the material formula, we represent it into a matrix. Okay. How do we represent the matrix? Actually, it's a very um, Clear. So each of the column represents one specific element, okay? And uh, then this row have different numbers, okay? So if the, you have the FE, you have one, then I'm going to have FE here and uh, put this bit as one, make sense? Yeah, because this corresponding to one. So this is going to represent the FE, and the B is also one. And so I put one, I put one bit here, all other is zero. And the uh, oxygen, you have three uh, oxygen atom. Then I put a, a one bit of three here. Okay, so so essentially any formula uh, in our case is represented as a binary matrix. Okay, beautiful, like beautiful binary matrix. Um, actually the reviewer asked us, why don't you represent it as numerical number, right? Why do you want to, you know, why don't you compress it, you know, into a simple one dimension, you know, numerical number? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, if you, you guys remember, the deep learning, one of the major advantages of deep learning is that it can learn to extract the complex patterns from an image, correct? So by converting our formula into if you do this kind of binary, you can think of the binary uh, white and black uh, image, correct? So essentially, we convert our formula into an image, and then we can take advantage of the convolution neural network, which is very good at, uh, you know, name the valid uh, patterns. So by putting this 120,000 of those kind of matrix together, the new deep neural model, they're going to learn which combination is uh, can lead to stable structure. 
stay from each other. Okay, so for example, you cannot have um, Fe and uh, five oxygen because if you have Fe B and the uh, oxygen five, and then it's going to have a pattern that uh, lead to uh, an un neutral chemical formula, which well invalidated its chemical validity. Make sense? So, so that is how you know we convert this uh, um, formula into numerical binary matrix representation. It led us to take advantage of the convolution network to learn the patterns. And uh, then after we do the you know conversion, we just take uh, you know the standard uh, generative adolescent neural network, which is composed of the generator, right? <laughs> And uh, uh, discriminate, right? Yeah, discriminate. So, um, generator here is uh, is the starting from random random uh, light in the space. Okay, you run the generate sample, and then the the model is going to generate a sample. Yeah, and you compare with the real sample, and then you use the real sample to train the discriminator. So it's going to improve the discriminator capability to detect if your generator did a good job or not. So, so in the beginning, the in the beginning the generator is very weak. So um, it's going to you know say train the discriminator to figure out uh, you know which is the um, which is the real sam training sample, which is the generated sample, and then you. You lock the discriminator and you train the uh, generator, trying to push the generator to improve its capability to generate more plausible samples. Okay, so the generator model is kind of that is what we call the at the rest of a new new network. So you are you are pushing, you know, by by comparing the um, generated sample and the real sample. By trying to push them to be similar, you are trying to both push the generator to generate more feasible, valid structures, and also you push the discriminator to, um, you know, discriminate the two uh, crystal structures and um, generate the fake structures. Okay, so so generate your uh, 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 adolescent network. It's one of the most successful generating model in the early stage, yeah, for um, for generating design. So it's not just for our uh, generating of chemical formula. You know, people have used it in many other image generation, um, music generation, and uh, yeah, video generation process. Okay, so but nowadays, you know, the latest the model is a diffusion model. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, still, there are many fields. Uh, this uh, um, generative address model still have you know a big advantage. So uh, with this idea, um, and we apply to our training data set, and then we generate the uh, you know ten thousand uh, um, uh, chemical formula, and then we check what percentage of them satisfy the chemical rules. Okay, so amazingly, if you look at this figure here, you know, for uh, some of the data sets, for example, for our model trained with ISSD uh, material database, which is this database accumulated, you know, all the clean um, materials. And you can see that up to 92, you know, 92, um, you have the generated the chart neutrality, Chart neutrality, which is here, ninety-two percent, eighty percent, eighty-four percent. So, um, based on this, uh, this SAD data set, we can achieve ninety-two percent validity in terms of the chart neutrality. Just think about it. You know, you you run the peak elements; they are not chart neutral. Most of them are not. But our model, they learn to generate the only you know ninety percent of them. They generated are charge neutral chemical formulas. So we don't tell them the charge must be neutral, right? We don't have this message to them. The program automatically figured this rule out because our training samples are all charge neutral. 
Okay, so so the power of of deep learning is that they can extract those uh, complex uh, constraints or rules of the automatically from the training sample. Okay, without without understanding, you know, where I I told my students, you even don't know much chemistry. <laughs> yeah, but it's still, you know, the model discovers the rule of the chart neutral and oscillation oscillation phase compat compatibility. Okay, so the second one it shows the formation energy, uh, formation energy of the uh, materials. Okay, so and um, if you look, look look at the formation energy, you know, based on uh, most of them, you can see most most of some of formation energy is uh, uh, around or below the zero, right? So in our uh, material sense, if the formation energy of a material is below zero. Uh, it's more likely to be synthesizable, to be stable. So you can see that, you know, many of the generative formula, it hides an, um, um, formation energy below zero. That means they are very likely to be um, to be synthesizable or, or to be stable. Okay, so we did another um, uh, evaluation of the performance, uh, which is very interesting, you know. So essentially what we do is we check the recovery percentage. So what does that mean? That means is that, for example, um, let's say uh, uh, this is the train recovery, this leave out recovery, this new way. So what does that this mean? This is very interesting, okay? So because in our material database, we have, for example, like uh, 20,000 binary compounds, binary material, okay? So after training our model, 78% um, of the no material we already we recover. That means our model all named the rule of the you know, of this uh, majority of the samples of the binary compounds. And also especially like this one. We leave out like you know like can be uh, like a few thousand uh, uh, few thousand binary material and our model it can recover 80 percent of them. Just think about it. Suppose this uh, material nobody has discovered it before, right? Sorry. So suppose this um, uh, suppose this material has not been discovered by in history, correct? So our our model essentially they can discover this eighty two percent of this uh, leave out materials, right? So that proves that it's a uh, it's very uh, really useful to to exhaust. Maybe it can you know if you run more, it can almost exhaustively find all the major type of binary materials. If you run more, yes, I have a um, question. Um, in um, you know there are some laws, uh, physical laws, chemical laws. Yeah, you may remember when we wrote proposal, there was this law related to protein thing. Um, uh, have you figured out a way to incorporate that? Yeah, of course, we are able to, you know, compute with vast spaces and you know, in generative airspace, but ensuring that, uh, you know, it is acceptable bonding or, um, you know, that will sustain over a period of time or things of that nature. Yeah. That is a desired property. Where, where are you incorporating that issue? Yeah. The, uh, maybe, maybe I missed it. You always say. Um. Very good question. You know. So essentially, our model, if you uh, right now our model. We are, you see, we just treat with the binary, you know, ma matrix, right? Without considering, you know, those, uh, let's say, without even considering the atomic uh, property, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, but if you add those uh, chemical constraints or uh, physical constraints into the training process, it can improve the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, actually, we just uh, uh, published a new a new paper that how do what we are saying is so the teaching neural network some physics. Okay. Yeah, it's it's very important, especially if you don't have a large amount of data. So you you have way small data, then you need the knowledge, you need those physical rules to to constrain the generation model so that it it don't you know generate garbage. Even if you have large uh, data set, uh, when you are asking the model to explicitly create. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Creative. It's going to be creative. Yeah. Yeah. So, so at that point, uh, there's some, some constraints. Have it's all, yeah. It's so, also uh, good. Yeah. Especially, you know, it must be true, right? Yeah. Some strong, you know, constraints. 
Then, and, and you may remember, uh, you know, let's say in drug discovery, uh, you want to make sure that it uh, likely uh, passes uh, toxicology uh, screening or yeah. such things. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there'll be some characteristics of what makes a material or uh, you know a drug can be toxic, right? And yeah. if there are such things can be incorporated in the process, it will not give you uh, matches that are useless. Yeah. Some people do it uh, post the processing. Um, some do it, you know, in doing the processing. Yeah, mm -hmm. doing the training. Like, um, then uh, you know our new paper is do is uh, in processing. You know we use pre training to input the physical knowledge. We use pre training. Yeah. So it's still part of the process towards the end, kind of thing also. Uh, in terms of use of the model. Yeah. The, yeah. So there's a, a, a more work to, to be done because, especially in material science, we usually we don't have a large amount of uh, labeled data. For example, if you want to find a superconductor, uh, right? Right now, the only about uh, um, most of the superconductor, they even don't have a structure. <laughs> you only find like uh, 300 uh, with structures. So uh, small data generative problem is a big issue. Okay. So um, so now you know we we you know we use this you know as uh, one of a major proof that our model it can really generate the uh, valid chemical formulas because it recovered eighty percent of the binary compounds that human experimentally identified in history, right? If this is not a proof, what is the proof? We just use existing right, existing material as proof. We just didn't do experiment myself, right? So so leave out the test recovery is one of the you know uh, big main uh, criteria to prove the effectiveness of some model. And uh, for ternary, our recovery rate is much lower because the ternary model you have three elements, right? So you have much more combinations. So yeah, with a limited limited sample, you you know your your the recovery is much. Smaller, yeah. If you have a quantum array, you have even bigger, you know, such combination space. So we, uh, our recovery rate is uh, with one million training. Then you know you only recover a much lower percentage rate. Okay. So uh, to show where our new structure, new formula are located, we we did a TSNE mapping. So essentially. We we map this uh, each of the formula into a uh, feature vector, and then we do a dimension reduction, and to plot this figure. And here you you show that uh, um, the um, the blue points, yeah, the the blue points is our training, and um, the uh, red one, um, red dot is the leave red dot is leave out the validation sample. Which is located in the green area, right? Because we randomly pick it. And also the blue area is the new formulas. And uh, I want to use, use this figure to show that, uh, you know, all the existing materials that a human has worked on for over, you know, 200 years is only occupy a minor portion of the, all the possible chemical space. So our world can be much more interesting much more powerful if we can uncover all those, you know, uncharted space, right? We can find many magic function materials in those unexplored area. So that's also value of our, you know, generating model. Okay, so now you guys understand the basic, uh, um, first GM model for formula generation. And now, second topic I want to talk about the using how do we use the transformer language model to do the chemical formula design without using the one called the numeric representation. Interesting, right? Why? Because our formula is a, a formula here. You know, uh, you can see we can easily expand it into a sequence of characters, right? So this sequence of element symbol is, is exactly the same as the text sequence in our natural language text. 
right? So if, if the natural if the transformer model can do language generation, because the language generation is also not an arbitrary, right? So you have the noun, you have the verb, right? You have the subject. So you need to satisfy the grammar syntax, right? To be to, to create a, a reasonable sentence. And in our formula, um, essentially, usually a formula, you have the uh, alien, you have the kidding, right? You have the metal elements, you have the, you know, in uh, metal, you know, non-metal elements, right? You need to put them together to become a stable structure. So essentially, the constraint of the element combination is, uh, is essentially very similar to the grammar constraint of a web and noun, right? So from that aspect, they are both, you know, constraints. That constraints a possible valid combination of the of the words, right? And here is uh, the constraints of the combination of the of the, uh, of the element of tokens. So uh, we come up with this idea. Okay, I say okay, we can convert our uh, chemical formula into this kind of uh, sequence. Okay, um, um, to make sure you know we. Uh, we want to make uh, make the uh, make the representation to be unique. So we sort we sort the element of the symbol by the electronegativity. So in this way, any formula is always represented by a unique you know sequence of tokens. So yeah, once you have the sequence tokens, you know we just uh, uh, we use the uh, uh, a blank filling transformer model. To uh for this generation design, okay. So um here it shows one uh, the basic idea of this um, uh, of this model, okay. So let's say you start with a, a formula sequence in the bottom, right? So um then you have a, a transformer encoding. So each of the tokens are represented by by a you know a transform transformer encoded a lighting feature. And then um, you do a linear and a soft max, and um, to get a to get a lightened representation here, and uh, you do a linear and a soft max to uh, to pick an element, and then um, based on this elements and your fit is a multi layer perception module, and um, you predict you know which yeah. Which of this, uh, um, which of the this failing um, lo location is more plausible? You know, so um, for example, if it, here, you know, for example, you start with this uh, blank, okay? So uh, to generate to fail this blank, what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to fail with this element, or you're going to fail this element and add one blank on the left. Oh, you fill this element with add one blank in the right. So, oh, you add the element with uh, you know two blanks between. So, so it's going to you know um, use this. Uh, um, you pick one of the one with one with the maximum probability that match our training 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 formula. Okay. So, so new network of the, of the blank training language model. It's going to you know. By tinkering with this blank filling process, it's going to then, you know, given any combination constraint, it can generate the valid elements that are considered in this blank. Okay, so essentially, uh, the the new neural model you learn the constraints of the of the element components in the sequence. You give any incomplete sequence, they can tell you. Okay, you need an oxygen here. Okay, yeah. If you have a lot of oxygen here, but you leave one thing here, then it's going to tell you, okay, here we need a, a a metal element, you know, with a positive charge. So it can name this, you know, uh, um, this uh, center, the chemical constraint that can guide you to generate new sequences. Okay, so um, so using this model. And uh, we um, we we generated the um, um, some test sample, and we also we check the recovery rate. So first, you see the chart neutrality. Okay, you see many of them. You know, many of the like this is the training sample, 
and this is a you know a generation ensemble is 89 84 so and this one is 92 so this chart new chart is even higher than our original gn model so yeah so this language model is better than our gn model and if you look at the recovery rates right all the time is you have this uh, look at the uh, train recovery train recovery uh, this is the chain recovery of the original GN model, and this is our transformer model, you know, wow, 20 percent better. Okay, so this transformer model is really good, works much better than our GN model, which is very surprising to us, you know. And um, so this is the new algorithm recovery, and uh, this is uh, GN new algorithm recovery. Look at this new algorithm recovery. This is crazy, right? 100% of the binary. So since you can generate all the new out the binary uh, compounds, uh, and also the C97, uh, for the temporary, this uh, recovery is much, much higher. If you remember, in our original GN, its recovery is like 30%. Yeah, but now it's increased to 18 and uh, 62. Yeah, so, um, so this language model surprisingly works well um, to, um, to generate the you know value the chemical formulas that we leave out, okay. So that um you know um and it's interesting you can see that because it, after we make the analog between the formula generation and the uh, natural language text generation, we actually only spend like uh, like three after long to make the system work. Yeah. So because the problem is very similar, if you understand the problem, um they have the similar. Uh, constraints. Okay, so um, so the first uh, next one is that you know we, uh, we want to generate not just formula right, right? because uh, formula uh, is even the chemical chart chart neutral it doesn't mean it is a stable and it doesn't mean it's synthesizable. So we usually we want to generate the structures. Okay, so. Um, so for this, we published paper in Advanced Science that we use a cubic, uh, you know, we use a GM model to, um, to, to, to generate the cubic structures. So this is the kind of structure with a very high symmetry, you know, cubic symmetry. So, uh, and this is our uh, generative um, adversary model. You can see the all, all architecture is very similar to our formula generator, right? The only difference is that our representation is not that uh, one quarter matrix, right? One quarter matrix is just representing the formula. But here we have each structure, they have the atom type, you have the atom coordination, correct? You have so many atoms in the unit cell, and each of them you have XYZ coordinates. So our input of our sample is represent the uh, uh, element, element, and uh, um, element embedding space group which is representing the symmetry and uh, run the noise, then our generator is going to generate the coordinates of the atom XYZ. You have the uh, mass of the unit cell parameter, you have the element type, you have the space group. So essentially, now our generator, you know, it's not just generate the uh, one hot matrix, it need, it need to generate the complete representation of the crystal structure. Okay, so, and then we're going to change the discriminator using, using the convolution network model to, you know, to, um, to discriminate the generator sample and the real sample. And this uh, um, GA model is going to push the generator to generate the uh, structurally, you know, stable and valid structures. So again, the same GA model um, but a different representation of our training samples. Okay, so um, so we generate you know hundreds of uh, um, actually we 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 build a website called the Carnella Material Database. So in that website, we collect the two hundred more than two hundred fifty thousand new hypothetical materials. Uh, online. So this is showing some of the crystal structures that we generated, and this is the you know form form of uh, uh, dispersion frequency uh, that shows the stability of the structure. So if you don't see any of this scale below the zero, 
then um, this quantum uh, quantum uh, mechanics simulation tells you this structure is stable. Okay, so this is a, a rigorous DFT uh, validation method for structure stability. So we uh, generate a lot of new um, uh, cubic structures. And um, we also do the TSE plotting, and then we, we want to show where is our new you know, structure located. And if you can see that you know, this dark green is our you know, new generated samples. And you can see that you know, uh, we, our new samples is uh, yeah, many of them located in, um, in a, a new area that is, um, actually we found some new structure that doesn't have any existing prototype in our training data set. So essentially we found some uh, material, uh, it's like a X, uh, let's say A7, B2. Yeah, we found this kind of uh, material that does not have any single case of this kind of formula. That means it found some totally brand new type of material um, that is stable, okay? So uh, this is our database. Yeah, right now it's uh, 200, uh, you know, 220,000. 20, um, we, we already see a lot of material team from other university because we have uh, uh, visiting records. We see which university, which IBGS visit our website. So we see, you know, the quite many uh, uh, top universities, they crawl our structure and then they they trying to find some interesting material and publish in the paper, okay. So, um, so this is our first try, and um, then um, we uh, next one um, imagine we trying to you know improve our generative effective by uh, including some physics, you know, yeah, physics guided the uh, uh, crystal uh, structure generative model and. Um, in our, this is the steel AGM model. Okay, and uh, if you can see that um, in our generator, we have some, you know, more um, complex uh, uh, constraint to uh, constrain the um, interatomic atom distance <coughs> and um, yeah, and the interdistance and the interdistance uh, with this uh, atom matrix uh, uh, transformation. So that, uh, in in this way, our generated uh, you know our generated sample is um, considering considering the constraints of the um, atomic distance relationship. Okay, so we need to if you don't put this information into this uh, model, then the generation process is the gener it's called a hallucination. You know, they generate uh, some um, artifacts of a crystal structure that doesn't follow this uh, you know fundamental. Uh, structure rules. So, um, so we we put this um, you know interatomic distance requirement uh, into the model, and it it gave us uh, um, um, including this, uh, for example, atomic distance knots, right? So if you, if if you add them, they are crowded together or they are too far away from from each other. Uh, we're going to have this um, inter and intra atomic distance um, uh, loss terms. Okay. And we also have symmetry compiling the base and the average full coordinate losses. So, you know, deep learning essentially, so you need to consider your problem specifics um, to, um, to add this, uh, you know, to tinker with this loss function, make sure the model learn to constrain, learn to generate the samples that, are, that are, uh, you know, are following those constraints. Okay, so this is, uh, um, which is right now mainly done the loss function, and also it's done, as I said before, we can use the pre-training process to, to do this. Okay, so use this method, we, we generate the additional more, you know, value the structure and put it into, into our Carolina database. Yeah, so um, so this is the, so basically, you know, um, uh, we, our work shows the feasibility that uh, to do the data-driven generative design. Okay, so, this kind of uh, design method is uh, trained by the existing design and uh, it's going to push the neural network to learn implicit knowledge by the neural network. It can be many uh, rules that we, we human humans don't recognize, okay? So um, by learning this increased rule from data, 
compared to the in regular optimization. In standard op optimization, you have more constraint. The problem is more difficult to optimize, right? Yeah, but ours, um, it can take advantage of this constraint makes our generation to be more effectively. So, um, so I have an analog for this is that um, our, uh, this generated approach design is just like a, a major way of design. I have a very funny analog for this. Just think about a frog. Does a mother frog knows how to assemble the atoms into a baby frog? They don't, correct? Yeah, they don't, but they can. So it's the evolution process that put all this assembly rule into the genome, into the DNA, correct? And then they follow the DNA to do developmental process and they give the best to the baby. So, so fundamentally, our work is a nature's way of design. Okay, that's one of the big message. Okay, so um, if you are guys are interested in do this, you know, read the discovery in the process, you know, welcome to contact me and visit in our uh, homepage of our lab, uh, machine learning and the evolution library. Okay, we have undergraduate, we have a graduate student, both you can work me for free or with some uh, stipend. Okay, so uh, yeah. Before you leave, do you have any good question? So when you generate new molecules and then you test them, seeing that if they've uh, recovered from the beginning of sample, I'd imagine that you also generate molecules that are possible, but are, were not in that sample, right? Yeah. So how do you measure the performance of, of like, do you do you want to generate, do you want to recover more or do you want to generate new models? Like, how do you measure, like, what what is more relatively uh, important to, yeah, of course, we don't change some new, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we have, you know, computational approach, you know, PFT calculation to simulate it and we check the uh, structure stability and check the if it's a chemical valid and um, check the sensitivity. So we, we have a set of rules. Um, yeah, that, that's the difference. You know, we are because we work with material scientists, they, so we use very strict rule to validate. But some computer science guys, they're not, they're not, you know, then they, they, they do very simple.